This is a CNA podcast. Welcome back to the Climate Conversations. I'm your host, Julie Yu. I live in the tropics, and it's hot and humid all the time. But this week, we are going to the coldest, driest, and windiest place on Earth. Antarctica is not a place built for humans, but for scientists, this barren land is fertile ground for new discoveries. This trip to Antarctica has been the most important trip of my life. That's Professor Benjamin Horton, director of the Earth Observatory Singapore, speaking during his expedition to Antarctica. He's been studying the climate for almost 30 years. He and PhD student Tan Bang Yi were part of a Singapore scientific expedition to the icy desert of Antarctica. So what's it like to spend the days in the land of penguins? What should you pack in your bag? And more importantly, why are scientists looking for new answers to environmental challenges in Antarctica? Professor Horton Fang Yi, thank you so much for joining me on The Climate Conversations. Professor, let me start with you. I understand it's not the first time you've been to a polar end of the Earth. Uh, you've traveled to the Arctic. I wonder how excited you were about Antarctica. I mean, has it always been on your bucket list? Yes. <laughs> so my career has been all about understanding how fast sea levels rising. Mm. And the driver for that are the ice sheets at the North and the South Pole. So I'd always wanted to go. I'd seen the end result of a melting ice sheet on the coastlines of Singapore or Southeast Asia, but I'd never seen the process responsible. And after I'd been to the Arctic, after I'd started to see how fast these landscapes are changing, I sort of made it a mission. Can we do this? Can we get to Antarctica? And it wasn't easy logistically. We had to raise finances. We had to construct a team. We had to think about timing and science. But we achieved our objectives. Yeah, it came together. And you weren't there alone. A team of eight people, including Fang Yi, was there with you. Fang Yi, when Professor Horton told you, you're coming with me to Antarctica, what went through your mind? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was like, what? Antarctica? <laughs> really? A lot of what I do in my PhD is like trying to study sea level changes in tropical regions. A lot of it is in response to the melting of ice sheets in the past. So I've read about the processes of ice sheets and how that relates to sea level. So then when Ben was like, do you want to go? And I'm like, yes, because I want to see these things that I've been reading about. I mean, Antarctica is known to be the coldest place on Earth, certainly not for the faint hearted. Were there a lot to pack? Did you have to mentally and physically prepare yourself to, you know, get yourself ready for this expedition? I mean, you know, you live and work in a tropical location, so you have to make sure you got the appropriate clothing. We were going to live and work on a boat, so you need to make sure that that's going to be okay for you, seasickness. And then I went there with quite an open mind. A lot of people had said to me that it will be a little bit of a life changer for you. You will be there and it will be unlike anything you've ever experienced or seen. So I would say, yes, you do get mentally prepared. Our best intentions was to pack all our luggage. And then when we arrived in the southern part of Chile, our baggage went missing. So that was a no. bit of a panic. Like if all the things that can go wrong, I mean, you can miss your fly. It was, I was a bit concerned about that you can lose things you know your passport or your visas or what have you but our luggage was key did you get it back yeah we got it like six hours before we were supposed to get on the plane but it was a bit nervous like the clothing things we lost our clothing so then the following morning we had to go to the shops there and buy everything but then the science equipment was worrying otherwise you know you sat there going like well we come out here to do the science it's not like you can knit back anytime soon i mean antarctica feels like somewhere that's so so far away way unreachable. Can you tell us how you actually get there and the modes of transportation, which route to take and how long the journey was? We flew from Singapore to New Zealand and then we flew across the ocean to Chile. So we went to Santiago and then we changed the flight, domestic flight to Punta Arenas, which is the southern tip of Chile. And then you fly across to King George's Island, which is in the South Shetland Islands. And then we get on a boat to then take oh us to the Antarctic goodness, That's quite a Peninsula. journey. And how it's long? 60 that hours. 60 hours. That's the whole thing. It's not easy. Mm, not everyone has actually gone to Antarctica. But when we think of Antarctica, I'm sure many of us conjure up an image of white majestic mountains, icebergs, untouched snow and penguins. I don't know. What was your first impression? The scale. It's absolutely massive. It's quite intimidating. You know, we were there 
for several days and we only covered such a small percentage of Antarctica, less than 0.1 of a percent of the coastline. Mm -hmm. And just to see its scale blew my mind. How much ice there is, the geology is just in your face. So that was my first impression. My second impression is how dynamic it was. Mm. The first couple of days, I mean, the weather was amazing. The oceans were like a mirror. It was so calm. We had wildlife popping out at humpback whales. I was overdressed at the end of it. I was just wearing a t-shirt, no hat, no gloves. T-shirt? Really? Uh, it was that so warm. warm. I mean, everything was working like clockwork. 6 or 7 a.m., you know, go and get your breakfast, and then you're out on the Zodiacs at 8 a.m. You're going to all these different locations, landing sites, doing your science, doing our filming. Then you get some information from the crew that we're now going into a low pressure system. Then you're starting to experience three meter swells. Then you wake up in the morning and instead of being able to see out to the horizon, you can't see hands and too rough for us to get off the boat so then you're just on the boat and the captain will try and move the boat to calmer waters but you're restricted by the conditions and that again is what antarctica is all about yeah i think like ben i literally it felt like a different planet for me because when we landed and i was like looking at the place i was like whoa i've never seen anything like that in my life it was just like barren just all rocks and then afterwards you see this like very hemispherical ice sheet just like we see in the papers and then i was like wow it's real must have been surreal for those of us living in Singapore, though, I mean, which is just one degree from the equator, the notion of Antarctica, it may feel incredibly distant, incredibly non-relevant. So why does the fate of Antarctica matter? Well, there's a variety of aspects about the poles are so important for our stable climate. I mean, first of all, they act as the refrigerator of our planet. Tropics get most of the incoming solar radiation, the poles get a minimal amount. And so heat through atmospheric or ocean are transported to the poles from the tropics, and that keeps our climate in equilibrium. The second aspect is that they also act as the mirror of our planet. So incoming solar radiation from the sun, about 90% of it when it hits ice is reflected back out into space, again cooling the planet. One of the big worries is that you have one of what's called a positive feedback is that if you lose the ice, the ice is replaced by either bare ground or in the Arctic and Antarctic by oceans. And oceans can only reflect around 30% of the incoming solar radiation. So you have this positive feedback. You warm up the planet, you lose ice, more radiation is absorbed. You warm up the planet, you lose more ice. And then finally, which is particularly pertinent to Singapore, is that every low-lying coastal nation will be influenced by what happens at the poles because they can have so much ice. I mean, it's just so big. We're aware that that ice sheet has enough water contained within its ice to raise global sea levels in excess of 60 metres. And when a third of Singapore is only one metre above high tide, you can see why it's important. Absolutely. And this was a 10 day long expedition. You conducted a wide range of research looking at things from atmosphere to the ocean and of course the ice sheets. But as a person who's been studying climate change for decades, I wonder what surprised you and what didn't? That's an interesting question. I've not thought about what didn't surprise me. I mean, the fact that the weather conditions were harsh at times did not surprise me. That was what I was expecting. What surprised me to begin with was the scale. One of the things we were like in our zodiac and we were right at the face of an ice sheet and you could see it melting and I was able to put my hand underneath that ice sheet and it was melting onto my fingers and it's onto my hands and that's going to trickle into the ocean basins and that causes the rise in sea level and that was quite like for me for someone who spent so long studying and that was like that just blew my mind me feeling it feeling that water being there doing that that's why you make the effort that's why you spend 60 hours traveling it was worth it just that moment Fangi I mean you did different different experiments on that cold, well, sometimes warm ground over there. <laughs> what was the biggest eye-opener for you? I realized how flexible we have to be when trying to conduct these experiments because we really have to work around the conditions and the weather. It's not like in Singapore where, okay, I know low tides are coming up this time. So I go out and study my corals at this time. Everything is predicted. I book the boats, I go. And then here it's like, we wake up and we're like, okay, this morning we can barely go out and they say we can land. So I quickly put my air samplers out on the boat and then we went to land. Then what I didn't expect 
back was while we were out on shore that it started to snow very badly. And then I was like, oh my God, my air samplers are right there. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it was very windy that morning. So I knew I had to secure the equipment, but I didn't expect it to like pour on it. Hey everyone, my name's Stephen Chia, and I'm host of CNA's weekly news podcast, Heart of the Matter. Now, each week, my job is to ask questions you have, like, why is the COE so high? Why aren't singles dating? Or what is going on with the red hot property market in Singapore? If you want the views behind the news, then tune in each week as we get to the heart of the matter. We are on the CNA and Me Listen apps and wherever you get your podcasts. Hit follow or subscribe so you don't miss an episode when it drops. So let's talk about the decline of the Arctic Sea. Where are we right now in terms of this melting process? What's the status? One of our problems is quantifying that amount of melt. It's not an easy thing to do because there's a lot of natural variability. So any individual year, if you want to compare the ice mass of Antarctica in 2022 to 2021, there's no scientist who can accurately say whether that's going to be positive or negative. But the scientific community will know over a decade that particularly Greenland is losing mass. Greenland's not small. It has enough water within it to raise global sea levels by seven metres. When we talk about sea level, sea level is rising and it has a variety of factors that drive that. And the two global factors is the heat of the oceans, which is called thermal expansion. You warm up ocean water, the water molecules occupy a greater space and sea level goes up. And that's about 30 to 40 percent of the sea level rise we've been experiencing in the 20 and the 21st century. The second driver is ice. And the most susceptible ice are the glaciers that we have seen retreating, be it the glaciers in the Alps or the Andes or Alaska. But what we've been worried about as a scientific community is now the input from these ice sheets. Greenland is contributing significant amounts of meltwater into the oceans, and now Antarctica is. And the worry is because they are such big reservoirs. That's the concern. So you combine Greenland and Antarctica together, and it's 65, 70 metres of sea level rise within it. So you only need to melt a small percentage of those ice sheets and you raise global sea level by one meter, two meters, three meters, five meters. And if we think about Singapore, low-lying coastal nations, it's been built up dramatically in the last 50 to 60 years. A third of this island is only one meter above high tide. And we are seeing some islands having disappeared already. And many governments are trying to put as many different strategies, installing seawalls, surge barriers, other coastal defenses. But can we actually slow it down? Do we still have a chance to turn things around? A lot of it has to do with reducing our carbon emissions mainly. And because of the lack, the time that it takes the ocean to respond, even if we stop all carbon emissions today, it's still going to take some time for the oceans to respond. Sea level rise is going to still continue, but the difference comes after 2100. Like what's going to happen, the trajectories that we take will dramatically influence what sea levels could be in the future. So it really comes back down to what we do with our carbon emission. Depends on and part of decisions humans are making now. What did your findings at Antarctica to tell you about the ways could help us adapt better or mitigate climate change? Sometimes we just continue to repeat the same points. But, you know, when I came back there, I had a renewed sense of urgency because it's so dynamic, but also because you want to protect these beautiful environments. I mean, when we were there, we tried to protect it the best we could. When we were leaving the boat, every time you left the boat, you had to be disinfected. Make sure that you didn't bring any contaminants from being on a boat with other people onto this pristine landscape. When we're on the pristine landscape, our soles of our feet are allowed on the land but nothing else. You're not allowed to sit. You can't put your hand down. You can't put your bag down. Oh, my. Cause some problems when we're trying to do scientific experiments. So we have to, like, balance it. So it's a good job we had some teeth. Everyone's got something in their hand. But that's how much we try to keep that environment pristine. So it gives you this sense of urgency. You can't leave anything to chance on climate change. I mean, there are people who are being born in Singapore today that will live in the next century. So the decisions that we make now will influence those children. 
I guess it's time that we wrap up, but would you encourage others to travel to Antarctica if they had a chance? We talked about being in there really feels very different, but also the carbon footprint it takes to go all the way to Antarctica. So that's why I think when we were there, we wanted to make sure that we obtain multiple objectives at one time. We do research, we do communication, and we collected the air samples. And then also we were collaborating with someone else in our research institute who needs samples from Antarctica to calibrate their model. So then we also collected samples for them. And so it's all trying to like get the most out of our trip there. So hopefully what we do will help. Professor, would you encourage others to go? Well, I think uh, Fangi explained that correctly. I mean, for a scientist like ourselves, having the opportunity to go to Antarctica really cannot be missed. But do people need to go to Antarctica to see climate change? No. They need to think how hot it was in Singapore yesterday. They need to look at torrential downpours in rainfall that we've experienced over the last year to 18 months and how it's affected your commute into work. You can pick up any newspaper. There's always a climate disaster. What's changed, unfortunately, is the predictions the scientists made about what was going to happen to climate in the 1980s and 1990s have come to fruition. If we don't do anything about carbon dioxide, within the next 20 or 30 years, we will have values of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere that's around 450 parts per million by volume. The last time we had that was 2.8 million years ago. What were temperatures then? They're about 3 to 5 degrees C warmer than today. So, wouldn't be 35.8, 36. Singapore would be 39, 42. Okay? What was sea level 2.8 million years ago? 10 meters higher. Singapore doesn't exist. That's not interpretation. They are facts. And that's the cold, hard truth. Thank you so much, both of you, for your insights. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me on Climate Conversations. Thank, Thank you. you. But thanks to my guests, Professor Horton and Fang Yi. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Do remember to subscribe and like this podcast so you know when a new episode drops. You can find CNA's climate and sustainability coverage online at cna.asia. The team behind this podcast is Joanne Chen, Sai Yen Win, Jacqueline Chen, and Crispina Robert. And I'm Julie Yu, signing off. <laughs>